Okay. Now it's time to start. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, uh, Dr. Hyukjun Kwon uh, from Imperial College London. Uh, he uh, did a PhD in Seoul National University. Then he moved to London, Imperial College London as a, a, a research associate. And he did uh, uh, very interesting things. Uh, and uh, I think this is a little bit new to me from his work. Mm -hmm. And uh, the title is uh, Quantum Computing and Quantum Error Correction, New Perspectives uh, Beyond Conventional Approaches. In the abstract, uh, he, is, uh, uh, he promises that it might work beyond, uh, uh, what is it, stabilizer formalism. Yes, so right. <laughs> this is your promise, okay? Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, let's welcome uh, Hyuk Jun Kwon. So can I share my screen now? Okay, yes. Uh, go ahead. And if you have a question, uh, uh, you can ask a, uh, some trivial question in the, uh, uh, during the talk. But if you have uh, some long questions, please uh, uh, ask him after the talk, we, we are going to finish around this. Uh, it, this will take about around one hour and a half. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Jayan Kim, for your kind introduction. And I would also like to thank uh, Professor Changbong Hyun for um, organizing this uh, wonderful colloquium series and for inviting me to give a talk today. So um, I'll talk about um, what is quantum computing and what is error correction today. So it'll be uh, mostly the overview of what is a quantum computing as, and what is the underlying principle of the quantum error correction. But as I promised, I, I will show you what, what, some, what is some new perspective beyond this uh, stabilizer formalism that how we can understand the error correction in the thermodynamic viewpoint. And also I'll talk a, a little bit about the quantum supremacy, which I have got some new results recently. So it is about how to simulate the quantum circuit using the classical computer. And we'll see that generalized quasi-probability distribution and its negativity plays an important role. So let's start about um, start with uh, talking about what is quantum computing. Around 100 years ago, we believed that the micro system, microscopic system will work exactly the same as a macroscopic system. However, the uh, discovery of the quantum theory changed uh, everything. So now we understand the electron uh, position of the electron near the atoms cannot be described in the uh, single point, but it can be only described by the probability distribution by using the wave function. And this caused very crucial problem that if you increase the number of the particle in this uh, quantum system, it will be very difficult to calculate the wave function and its dynamic according to the Schrodinger equation. So here comes a new idea how to simulate this kind of complicated quantum system. And it has been predicted by Richard Feynman that we need some new tools to simulate these quantum um, wave functions. So his prediction is like, um, as we can, simulate the classical system, for example, the planets uh, orbiting around the sun by mapping this uh, position of the planet into the binary data and use a classical computer to compute, uh, estimate or to predict the trajectory of the planet. We need to encode this uh, wave function to some other quantum system, which is more controllable to uh, effi efficiently simulate this kind of wave function, even for the uh, many particle limit. And this is kind of a, a, a very profound foresight because he didn't know about many things about the quantum theory, uh, I, not quantum theory, quantum information theory, because we do not have any word about that. And the classical computer they had in the 1982 when the Feynman predicted about this uh, quantum computation, the classical computer has only the memory of like 74 kilobytes. So it's quite um, impressive uh, foresight, I, I would say. 
So in order to understand the difference between the classical and quantum computing, we have to see what's the difference between bits and qubits. I think many of you already heard about what's the difference between the classical bit we call bit and the quantum bit and we, what we call the qubit. So the classical bit can have a two different variables u and one, while the um, quantum qubit can have uh, qubit can have uh, all the possible superposition between u and one. And Maybe some of you already heard about that computation power come from that we have a all um, various possibility that can be described as superposition between zeros and one. And I'll say that that is quite far from the complete explanation. The real interesting thing happens when you go to the multiple bits and multiple qubits. So if, even if you add one bit to the another, you'll see that there is a, only four possibility of the outcome that you can have. On the other hand, if you go to the quantum system, if you have a two qubit and the, this um, wave function can describe in the following ways, and we can realize that there's a no way, there's some state that we cannot express in the uh, product of these um, two individual qubits, which means that we have, in order to understand the uh, information stored in two qubit, we have to look it in whole, not by looking at the individual uh, qubits. And this is what we call entanglement in quantum information theory. And we can show that it, there's no any classical explanation possible to explain this kind of uh, um, correlation between the two different um, qubits. And actually this is kind of common behavior in the quantum system. For example, if you see the uh, ground state of a helium, the electron of the helium to electron are perfectly anti-correlated so that they're point on the opposite direction, whatever angle that you measure the spin. So if you go to the more qubit, like n bits and n qubit, it becomes more um, complicated. So you can see that if you increase the number of the qubits, the, um, the possibility of the correlation or the combination of the correlation exp exponentially grows up and it becomes really hard to calculate. So when n, the number of the qubit becomes larger um, up to like um, 300, the number of the possible correlation will exceed the number of the atom in our universe. So this actually um, explains why it is hard to simulate the quantum system. And it gives some clue that why we can do some more um, fast um, computation using the quantum computer using these kind of correlations. So what we can do using this kind of um, quantum computing so first we can simulate the quantum system as Feynman first, first uh, predicted. So we, uh, the um, promising uh, application is that we can calculate the um, uh, chemical reaction very accurately by uh, calculating the, uh, this uh, Schrodinger equation and the density matrix. Then we can design more efficient way to find the chemical synthesis like a, a synthesized of ammonia and we can have a more um, um, effect um, productive of the medicine with a lower cost. And also we can simulate uh, the many-body quantum system and we can calculate the um, um, energy level of a very complicated system in the uh, uh, quantum physics. And that is also a very important problem to find the new materials in material science. But most uh, striking uh, um, application of the quantum computation is like we can solve the mathematically challenging problem. Um, it has been started by the uh, uh, discovery of the Shor algorithm, which is that we can factorize a large number using the quantum computation and that can possibly break the RSA crypto system. And some other um, our, uh, quantum algorithm, for example, fast searching and hypothesis test testing algorithms have been also found there. And now people are believing, uh, now believe to um, say that uh, quantum computing ha has a um, very powerful application to solve the very difficult problem in mathematics. And this is kind of um, becoming a real because last year, the, I think the most important news in the computational community is, like, is that Google announced that they already got the uh, quantum supremacy and their competitor is not just a classical computer, but the state of art classical supercomputer. And they say that their quantum computing chip can overperform the, the best uh, classical supercomputer they can make in these days. 
Also, there are some related applications like uh, quantum cryptography and quantum metrology, but I'll, I'll skip this part on today. So let us look at more deeply on how does the quantum circuit looks like. As you can see in this uh, Google's picture that you can see that this is quite similar to the classical computing unit like CPU. And we, if you look closer inside and you'll see that there's a real similarity. So as the quant uh, classical um, device, uh, computing device is constructed using the classical logic circuit, we can also construct the quantum circuit like this. And this looks very similar, similar. But the difference is that the element of this logic gate of the classical and the quantum circuit is different and they use a different logic. So that makes the very difference between the classical and quantum computers. And so now uh, what the uh, com quantum computing people are doing is like how to arrange this quantum logic to have a, a, a fast algorithm to solve the complicated mathematical problem. Actually, you can try it yourself to build your own circuit and IBM Q experience uh, is providing a um, free toolkit to do this. For example, you can put every channel like this and do some measurements and you can see a very interesting thing happening in the quantum system. And you can even simulate in their uh, five qubit um, um, cl cluster computing on the IBM Q machine. So what is the current issue? So after the discovery of the quantum algorithm, we have a uh, significant development. So we can generalize our uh, conventional algorithm to a more generalized um, theorem. And we can also have some new uh, algorithm like a hybrid approach between the quantum calculation and the uh, classical optimization problem, what we call the variational quantum eigensolver, and which is attending a very um, popular uh, topic in this field. Also, we can think about the quantum machine learning by combining the classical machine learning to the quantum principle. Um, regarding this, I had a very um, uh, interesting uh, result recently and we have a big collaboration, including some uh, researchers in Kias, including um, Prof. Um, Dr. Jung Obang, Dr. Yong Lim, and Professor Jiang Kim. But I, I don't think I have, I have enough time to explain all the details here, so I'll just, um, just mention this. And the another uh, issue is like how to build the quantum devices to construct the physical circuits. And the, uh, most of the uh, industrial companies are uh, interested in this. So Google, IBM, and some other companies are doing this with their own uh, physical platform. So the possible platform to build the quantum circuit or the quantum um, chips would be the quantum computing qubit, or trapped ion and cavity QED, and so on. Um, and Google and IBM is using the superconducting qubit, but I wouldn't say that would be the most promising the device at the end because we do not know uh, if we are just a starting point at the race and we, we do not know who will end up the race first to reach the final goal of the quantum computers. However, today I'll explain uh, some different things from the quantum algorithm and quantum devices that we call the quantum error correction. Maybe some of you already heard about this, but and some of you would, uh, would not. But I would say that the quantum error correction is the essential technology to reach the universal computation. And I'll explain soon here. So why, why do we need this quantum error correction? The main reason is that the quantum system is fragile against the noise, what you call decoherence. For example, if you even if you prepare the quantum state in the superposition state, if you have a decoherence, it will collapse into the classical part. So it is not become no useful anymore. So if, for example, it, it, it'll cause the errors in the quantum circuit. So for example, if you, even if you construct the quantum circuit like this, if there is a decoherence, there will be errors in some places. And this quantum computer will predict uh, differently what we can expect from the correct answer. And the problem in the quantum computer in current status is the error rate is very high. So we can expect a 10 to the minus four error rate for the operation. And that is very optimistic viewpoint. So if you have to run like a million of the operation on the quantum circuit, then more than the hundred error will occur and that will not give any meaningful answer. We can compare this error rate to the classical one, which has a very uh, extremely low um, error rate uh, per operation. So that's why we can do the uh, classical computation in a safe way. 
So how to handle this? So what we have to do is like, we have to encode our quantum information safely and try to protect against error and try to recover it back to uh, useful information that we want. And that is what we call quantum error correction. So we can um, use a principle uh, of the classical um, error correction. So for example, if you have a classical computer, like uh, uh, consists of the bit and the uh, dominant error is like bit flipping, like having a zero to one and one to zero. And in order to um, recover this errors in the classical computer, we can simply uh, make a multiple copies, what we call the redundancy. So for example, if you have a zero, we can just copy it in uh, multiple zeros and multiple one. And even if some errors are occurring in some, cube, uh, some bits, we can realize that the uh, zero are dominant on this um, uh, string. So we can say that, oh, there are some errors, but the, uh, the logical um, uh, answer is zero. So we have to just convert every one to zero to make a correction. And that's how the quantum computer corrects their errors. So we can ask that we can, can we uh, say, apply the same principle to the quantum computers, but some problem um, really occurs. The most critical problem is that quantum state cannot be copied, that we call the no cloning theorem, which means that we cannot simply copy as in the classical uh, cases. So quantum information cannot be simply copy and pasted. And that's a crucial problem for the quantum computers. Secondly, if you try to measure the system, it will disturb the system. And that's what we call the wave function collapse. And that's another problem, the quantum error correction. And the third uh, problem is that uh, we can see that the, the classical computer bit flipping is the only error, but uh, we have additional errors of like a phase flipping because we have uh, all the possibility between zeros and one. So how should we do that? So the basic idea is like, we have to encode the qubit into the correlation that I, I shown before. So I'll attack every problem step-by-step step. So I'll start with how to uh, in overcome the problem that the quantum state cannot be copied. Even though that quantum state cannot be copied, we can encode the quantum information into the correlation. And that can be described like uh, in, for example, in the following circuit. So it is not the copying the quantum state, but spreading the information uh, within to the correlation between these three qubits then you can say that uh, if some error occurred in the single qubit, like say qubit, second qubit has a flip, bit flip error, then it will have this kind of error um, outcome. Then the next problem is that we have to measure this uh, quantum state without disturbing the system. Some people might believe that it is in, this is impossible, but by just uh, not measuring the individual uh, qubit, but just checking the parity of these two qubits, that can be done without disturbing the state. So this is what we call the syndrome measurement. So what we do is, is that not just measuring the um, individual particle, but we measure the just a parity of two. So we can see that first and the third uh, qubit has the same parity and the other has a different parity. And using this uh, syndrome measurement outcome, you can conclude that there's something wrong in this uh, second qubit. And by correcting this qubit, we can have an original uh, state um, recovered back. The third problem that the, uh, the other source of error that, for example, bit, uh, phase flipping error can be also handled in different ways. It, it can be simply handled by encoding the zero and one to some different uh, basis bit, which is also possible in the quantum computing because we can have arbitrary superposition. And the interesting uh, thing to note is that if you have a plus and minus encoding, phase flipping becomes the now the bit flipping in the plus minus basis. So we can apply the same um, similar type of the syndrome measurement to detect uh, where the phase flip has been occurred and we can correct them successfully. So the next question would be like, how can we do this a bit flipping and phase and flip correction simultaneously? And the answer is we, yes, we can. So, uh, sure, um, uh, propose this kind of uh, error correcting code, and this error correcting code can actually correct every single bit qubit errors. And that's a very surprising result because um, people have 
now try to and now it's starting to believe that we can actually do the error correction in the quantum circuit. And this can has been developed into the seven cubic code we call the CSS code. And then people trying to uh, search what is the generic way to uh, measure this syndrome and apply the correction protocol. And that's what they call the stabilizer formalism. In the stabilizer formalism, we can have a multiple uh, set of the um, uh, set of the stabilizer consists of the set stabilizer operator, and this tell us how um, directly how to encode the quantum state that we can encode the quantum state into the code space using the stabilizer state, and we can uh, it also tells us how to detect the correct error using the syndrome measurement consisting of the stabilizer measurement. Um, I'll explain this by just uh, giving a simple example by uh, using the five qubits best stabilized code, which is consists of four different um, stabilizer operator. And this uh, stabilizer operator acts as a syndrome measurement, just as we did in the parity check in the previous three qubit cases. So by looking at this a syndrome measurement outcome, we can extract all the syndrome. And by using this syndrome measurement outcome, you can detect uh, successfully diagonalize where the error has been occurred, and you can uh, successfully correct every cube. And now uh, people are now uh, interesting uh, to correct the error beyond the single qubit errors. And there's more advances code, like for example, the most promising one is a uh, topological quantum computing code, and it can be developed into surface code, and that can uh, correct more than a single poly errors. And I'll say that. Uh, Although this has a more complicated uh, a structure, it stands from the stabilizer formalism so that we can say that a stabilizer formalism provides a very powerful toolkit to correct these quantum errors in systematic ways. However, it, is, it should be highlighted that the, there are some errors that cannot be corrected by the uh, stabilizer formalism. For example, if the error occurred in two uh, bits simultaneously, two qubits simultaneously, and if you try to correct this error using the stabilized formalism, you uh, see the opposite result that all the bits are now flipped in the, uh, on the other way around. So these errors can be accumulated throughout the circuit. And if you want to suppress the, uh, the uh, logical error probability due to this error, we will need more qubits and more syndrome measurement and more correcting operation. However, if you introduce more qubits and more measurement and operation, it means that we are adding additional nodes because we are device is not perfect. So there might be the trade-off that um, adding the more qubit will give a better answer or it could be worse. So we can see here from the uh, many texts that we have to uh, have a, some threshold value and we have to be below this threshold error rate to make sure that the increasing number of the qubit helps to correct error um, better. So what, this is what we call the full tolerant quantum computation, which means that we have to uh, have an error rate beyond this threshold to make sure that the, we are correcting error faster than adding a new qubit and the error will be created more. So this is a basic, uh, uh, um, principle of the quantum error correction, what we call the uh, quantum threshold theory. So where are we now? So I just bought this uh, figure from the uh, um, uh, John Martinez, uh, uh, the Google's uh, uh, conference uh, presentation, and it really um, describes what is the direction we have to proceed. So here, this is the error correction threshold, which means that if you have an error rate, uh, low, um, worse than this uh, threshold is not meaningful to increase the number of qubits because it will add some more errors when you have uh, uh, more qubits. So we, we have to go below this error threshold, then we have to go increase the number of qubits, which we call scaling, so that we can have a, a lower error rate for the uh, logical qubits. And we are at very interesting stage, I would say, because we are very near to the error correction threshold, but we did not have a, a, get any um, um, solid error correction code, uh, error correcting devices yet. So John Presque uh, um, quoted this as a, a noisy intermediate scale quantum error. 
because we are very close to the error correction threshold and we are trying to scale up these qubits. And even though it is very hard to get the uh, um, error correction um, for the universal quantum computation, for example, doing, the, doing some useful algorithm like Shor uh, factorization algorithm, but we are trying to scale up these devices and some find some new uh, application that can be done with a, a small number of the qubits. And that's where we are now. And um, we are trying to uh, develop, push them to the uh, real uh, error correcting codes and devices. So now I'll uh, try to talk about what is the alternative approach to the error correction code. And we'll just, uh, um, first we have to review what's the error in the stabilizer code. In the stabilizer code, the error could be either correctable if this is inside the correctable set, and it could not be correctable when it's outside of the correctable set. And this can uh, frequently happen if the noise model is beyond the power link error basis. So my question is that what you can do for the errors, which is outside the correctable set. And to understand this, we have to have a precise understanding of the quantum noise. And maybe it will be possible to have the approximate quantum error correction code. So I'll call this as a, as a thermodynamic or entropic approach because um, the, when the error channel happens to the quantum circuit, it close, uh, we can consider this as a some system is interacting with a heat mass. And this is quite interesting viewpoint because actually we can uh, convert every uh, noise channel into this uh, shape, which means that we can always interpret the error channel as the interaction with the environment but we lose some information by discarding the information uh, environment part but, and just keeping the system part. So we can consider there is some information leak out to the environment and that is responsible to the imperfect quantum error correction. Then so how we can quantify this quantum information loss? It can be quant uh, quantified by using the von Neumann entropy. Uh, I wouldn't uh, say um, describe the detail, but we can say that there is a quantity that we can define to quantify what's the information leak out to the environment. And this viewpoint gives a very interesting result that we can have a perfect error, condi uh, error correction condition if, if and only if there is a no information leak out to the environment. And that's a very good thing. However, in general, um, this kind of information loss is always positive. So we we'll have in, always have, um, in many cases, we we'll have an uh, imperfect error correction. And the interesting question is that what would be the error correction bound? So bef like uh, many years ago, um, it had, this question has been already asked by um, very um, many researchers. For example, the Benjamin Schumacher, uh, who is the inventor of the word qubit, uh, has already uh, studied this problem and found out that uh, we can have an average recovery rate is related to the information loss of the, uh, um, due to the uh, interaction between the system and the environment. But the problem is that he cannot find what is the explicit recovery operation to uh, achieve this rate. And a little bit earlier than his result, uh, result uh, there's another approach that uh, have a result we can have a nearly optimal recovery operation, but its relationship between the information loss is unknown. Actually, Benjamin Schumacher also knows about, uh, knew about this result, but he concluded that the uh, re relationship between these two approaches is not clear. And I would like to say the recent progress now we have is we can have a close connection between these two approaches. In order to do this, we have to first improve this uh, Schumer uh, condition here to have a more uh, stricter bound. Then we can find out that there is an explicit recovery map that satisfies the both conditions. So we can have a rec explicit recovery operation, what we call the uni universal recovery map or the generalized path recovery map that can satisfy um, the this inequality, which means that um, the average fidelity is lower bounded by the information loss. And it is nearly optimal uh, to correct the error of the quantum noise channel. So 
This can be uh, done by uh, refining the quantum data processing inequality. And it, it does not show that this result, but we can uh, modify or uh, uh, reinterpret this uh, quantum data processing inequality, which has been disco discovered uh, very recently. And we made a thermodynamic interpretation. By doing this, we can actually realize that the information loss is nothing but we can understand that the entropy production in the non-equilibrium thermodynamics. And as you can expect that this entropy production is also um, responsible to the irreversibility of the uh, non-equilibrium quantum system, non-equilibrium thermodynamic system. So we can um, make uh, the uh, strong connection between the quantum entropy production and the information loss, and they are actually equal. Another interesting thing that uh, using this thermodynamic interpretation is that we can also find the fluctuation relation, for example, Jardinsky equality, and we can also find the, uh, this explicit recovery map satisfying this bound. So uh, for more information, you can um, um, go through my uh, talk last week, which is available in the conference website, the quantum thermodynamics workshop um, conference. And also you can um, attend the uh, next week's uh, um, colloquium talk the this Jarzinski, um, who will talk about more interesting stuff, uh, how you can generalize a quantum um, thermodynamic ball into the nanoscale or the quantum regime. And I'll, I'm also looking forward to listen, uh, listen to his talk. So uh, before I move to the example, I'll show you the, how much improvement that we got. So this is a previous bound and this is a new bound. And we can see that there is significant improvement and I would also like to highlight that this is a lower bound. So um, the actual recovery fidelity we can get is always upper uh, than here, this bound. So it is very good. So which means that the, uh, we can approximately recover the errors of the quantum channel by characterizing this by the information loss. And this is quite robust. So uh, as an illustrative example, I'll uh, give some example on uh, how this uh, error correction on the recovery protocol works well. So we can take the model of the amplitude damping, which is a com very common model uh, when you um, encode your quantum information to the two level system, because when the excited system will um, emit the photon and become the ground state and lose all the information about the superposition. And that is kind of a common loss model in the uh, cavity um, and the atomic system. We can compare the uh, uh, three different cases. For example, uh, we can encode uh, our uh, uh, qubit to the stabilizer code like 000 plus 111. And otherwise, we can encode into arbitrarily uh, um, basis, orthogonal basis of the uh, three qubit uh, Hilbert space. And then you can apply either a path recovery map that I um, explained as the optimal, nearly optimal recovery map and the stabilized code, uh, we, we, what we have um, uh, known before, like uh, doing the measurement, syndrome measurement and the recovery. And you can see that there is an improvement that we, if you are using the um, path recovery map, you can have a, a upper, um, higher recovery fidelity compared to the stabilizer formalism. And this is a good thing. And what we are mostly interested in is like this region where the uh, damping rate is low and we have a high fidelity recovery. And then we can see that the stabilizer encoding with path recovery map and the stabilizer recovery gives a similar answer. But if you try to optimize by using the random encoding, it will give a better answer. So we can see that the approximate error correction code can be better than the uh, st stabilizer formalism. But I just tried to encode the uh, uh, quantum system by just randomly encoding it. But we do not know what would be the most compact way to do the encoding process. So we are now, we have focused on the what the recovery for process, but we do not know what's the uh, uh, um, best way to encode the quantum qubits. So now I want to uh, say some more, uh, some interesting results that um, people are trying to look into in, uh, about the encoding process and that we call the holographic quantum error correction. So um, I'm not the expert in this uh, field in the uh, holographic theory or the high energy physics, but the important result that they have made in this field is like, is that 
finding the bulk information of the d-dimensional di system can be retrieved from this boundary. For example, uh, the d-dimensional information can be uh, encoded, fully encoded in the d minus one dimension. And this is what we call the ADS-CFT correspondence. And recently it has been uh, applied to the error correction code. So uh, John, uh, the researcher including the John Preskill has been uh, proposed a way to encode the quantum information using this holographic principle to protect the error against the particle loss. And yeah, uh, uh, there's some um, interesting application on the black hole thermodynamics in, in information paradox in the um, astrophysics and the high energy physics, but I'm not expert in this field. But what I know about this uh, uh, holographic error correction code is that it is very re related to the uh, uh, some to um, to investigate the in interior of the black hole. For example, uh, we can model this as a quantum information scrambling to uh, recover the uh, information from back from the black hole. And there's also a very interesting uh, direction to connect this adfc correspondence to the error law of entanglement, which is also very um, universal, but not fully understand it um, uh, uh, property of the um, many body physics in regarding the entanglement. So what would be the next? So I'll say that it will be very interesting to uh, combine these co two concepts. So we, if you can encode the, uh, uh, our quantum information to using the holographic principle and apply the approximate recovery operation, which is nearly optimal, then we, we, we might have some new results that to um, recover the error uh, in more efficient way. And actually people are trying to looking at this uh, direction more um, rigorously because uh, now in the high energy physics society, they're trying to um, apply this patch recovery map to uh, recover the information from the boundary to uh, recover the bulk information. And the other side in the quantum information society, we want to uh, apply this uh, error correcting code and we want to make sure that this is really working very well. And the uh, additional thing that we have to do is like how to implement this path recovery map in the error um, in the quantum circuit, uh, which has a very recent result here. And uh, I'm also preparing a result that how can, how can we implement this path recovery map in the physical system, like using the continuous Lindblad and operator. So the interesting question that we can ask next is like, how many qubits are needed to correct the physical error using the uh, holographic principle and combined with the uh, approximate recovery operation? And would it be better than the conventional approaches? And if, if it is possible, then uh, we can ask that, can it be implemented full tolerantly? Which means that can you scale up these uh, devices to make a full tolerant error computation, error correction? And if so, then what would be the error threshold? And that would be a very interesting question. And also, as you can ex expect that this uh, holographic principle has many relations to the uh, various physical fields and topics. So uh, understanding the what's the most compact way to store and, in, uh, store and recover the uh, quantum information would be a um, very interesting issue to explore in the various uh, physical field. So I'll just give a, a short summary before I move on to the next topic. So what we have learned from the error correction. So error, quantum error correction can be summarized by encoding the quantum information within the quantum correlation. And I also talk, uh, told you that the net, uh, quantum error correction is uh, necessary for uh, universal quantum computation. And to achieve the universal quantum computation, we need a full tolerant quantum computation, which means that we have the error level below the some threshold. And we have, then we have to increase the number of qubits to suppress the overall uh, error rate of the logical qubit. And that's, what we, um, that's what we are, why we are interested in the error correction in quantum regime. And to, uh, I also introduced what is a stat stabilizer formalism, which I call it as a conventional approach and most popular approach. And the stabilizer formalism tells a very, very good systematic way to encode the quantum information in the stabilizer state. And it also tells you how to detect the quantum error and the correct them. 
and this very useful uh, useful formalism and yeah, of the quantum error correction code. On the other hand, we can understand the quantum correction in some different way using the thermodynamic viewpoint. And this is uh, how they, uh, we can construct the approximate quantum error correction code. By understanding that the uh, uh, information of the lo information loss in the noisy quantum circuit is related to the optimal recovery rate, we can construct the approximate quantum error correction code. And we can also have a more uh, advanced uh, quantum error, error correction code by including this quantum information using the holographic principle. And that can be a new direction for uh, the quantum error correction. So um, before I move on to the next topic, if you have any question on this error correction, I would be happy to answer before I move on. Okay, um, seems to be no question. So let's move on to the next topic. So I already explained that we are at the uh, NISC era, what you call the noise intermediate scale quantum devices. And the, we are really at the borderline between the classical similar reason and to see some quantum uh, advantage. So the interesting question is that how can we define what is classically similar and what is what we cannot? And rigorously defining this quantum supremacy or the quantum advantage is very non-trivial problem because you can, even though this kind, it seems to be have a borderline here, this, but this borderline is very fuzzy that we cannot uh, tell what is exactly uh, doable in the classical simulation and uh, what is not doable. I'll just briefly explain why this is a hard problem. So in order to characterize the quantum supremacy, we have to learn what is the complexity of the quantum problem. So we have a, a, the problem space here, and the P is a, uh, and we have a P and NP uh, problem in the uh, classical computational theory. And we expect that the uh, BQP, what we call is that um, quantum computer can um, effectively, efficiently solve the problem in the polynomial time in non-deterministic way. It's quite hard, but, uh, but we do not know where the quantum computational power is, um, um, along this um, um, complexity problem. And this is because a uh, computational complexity problem is uh, very challenging to solve itself. For example, we do not know, uh, uh, we haven't any proof on the uh, P equals MP or uh, other way around. And the another problem in the quantum computing is that we do not exactly know uh, which circuit elements lead to the quantum supremacy. And that is very important problem and the crucial problem in the quantum computation. And I'll explain more in detail soon. And as we are in the noise intermediate era, which means that we have to deal with the noise circuit and the system side is a finite. So even if the uh, scaling behavior is exponential or having a high order of polynomial, if the system side is small, there is also possibility to simulate this kind of system in the classical computers. And that is very uh, why this uh, problem is quite hard to um, solve um, in this um, noise intermediate era. But I'll say that, that there is also some recent progress that uh, we call the shallow circuit. So uh, we can uh, definitely see some advantage even we have a, a small number of say um, layers on the, or the qubit operation and with some noises. But in general, if you give a circuit and if you ask that, is it simulable classically or not? And that is very hard to uh, answer in general cases. So um, I would like to address this uh, uh, problem by looking at how far we can simulate the quantum circuit classically. And I would show you that there is some uh, very in interesting and surprising results that we already have. So we can consider the quantum circuit consists of the initial state preparation and quantum go on through the quantum circuit and do some uh, measurement. But we can restrict ourselves to have a just uh, computational basis pr preparation, like having an old qubit to be zero or one old qubit to be one. 
and we can restrict the uh, logical gate set as um, a Hadamard, phase, poly, and C0, and we what we call a Clifford gate. And you do the measurement on the x, y, z basis of this point at each uh, qubit, then we will have a surprising result that this kind of qubit can be effectively simulated using the classical computers. This is what we call the Gottesman Neil theorem. And this is uh, why this is a surprising re result is that CNOT gate is actually entangling gate. So which, which means that even if you start with a computational basis, at the end, it will be fully entangled if you apply the multiple time of the CNOT gate. However, it is quite, so it's quite surprising that even this circuit can generate entanglement, it can be still simulated in the classical way. So now people are trying to look at what then what is a, a, a golden resource to uh, achieve the quantum advantage and they're trying to look at some um, quantum gate outside this Clifford gate, what they call the T gate, or many people refer to this as magic gate to make a quantum computer to have a supremacy over the quant classical computers. They're also looking at magic state. So, but I'll say that this is not fully solved problem because we do not know what exactly the role of the magic gate and the magic state plays role in the quantum circuit to give a advantage in the of the quantum simulation in general sense. So in order to understand uh, why this uh, happens, so why we can simulate the uh, quantum circuit using the classical computers, we have to look at some other quantum principle, um, which is uncertainty principle. So um, I just remind you what's the uncertainty principle is like, um, um, prediction of the, if you want have try to predict the position and the uh, momentum of the particle at the same time, it is basically impossible, which means that position and the momentum of the particle cannot be measured simultaneously in the quantum regime. And uh, physicists uh, uh, try to solve this problem. For example, Eugene Wigner, who is a, a Nobel Prize winner, asked that the, how we can represent uh, S and P together. And he invented some formalism to uh, represent the quasi uh, X and P together. And this is what he called the Wigner distribution or the quasi probability distribution. But uh, we can recognize that this uh, quasi probability distribution is not exactly the same as a classical dis distribution because it can have a negative values. And this negative value is actually the signature of the quantum nature. For example, if, if you go through the uh, look at the beginner function of the Schrodinger's cascade, and you'll see the negative value happening here. And we can also uh, extend this uh, to the uh, discrete variable system, which means that the position and momentum can be discretized. And using this discrete phase space, we can also construct the Wigner distribution of the discrete phase space. And for example, if you have a three dimensional system, the phase space will be three by three matrices and each uh, matrix will have uh, some probability distribution. An interesting thing that you can note here is that if you have a computational basis zero and uh, plus in y m direction uh, or x direction, then you'll see no negativity is happening here. But if you go to the magic state here, you can see that there's a, a negativity in the Wigner distribution. And now people are trying to relate this negativity is actually the source of the quantum computational power but we do not have any rigorous or uh, clear result at, at this point. So this is very um, a non-trivial question to ask. And if you want to know more about uh, uncertainty principle and the quantum measurement related to this, I would also uh, recommend the um, uh, Valerio's uh, talk, uh, which is uh, next month. And yeah, it'll, yeah, he'll tell us much more interesting story than how the uncertainty principle plays a role in quantum theory. So um, I'll explain that how we can simulate the quantum circuit if they have no negativity. So the basic uh, idea is like, uh, is we can consider the quantum state as a stochastic update of the phase space distribution, which means that if the quantum state pass through the logical gate and go to the uh, another state, this can be actually in interpreted as a stochastic process by preparing some initial distribution and have some conditional uh, 
probability distribution to describe the update function to get the final distribution of the uh, uh, in the phase case. So we can do this in following ways. First, we have to uh, sample uh, randomly the uh, based on the distribution of the initial state. So we can pick a one a random point here, and we can do the step stochastic update using this uh, update function. So we have a conditional probability, so we can randomly uh, update the uh, phase phase point using the metropolitan algorithm or uh, other uh, stochastic methods. Then you can repeat this uh, to the, all the uh, possible quantum circuits, and you can do a uh, collect the multiple trajectory by starting with some different random points and sampling it. And after the sampling all these trajectories, you can collect them to have a, a final distribution function. And based on this uh, final distribution function, you can actually estimate what's the measurement outcome by using this formula to update the final uh, um, uh, outcome trajectories. So um, now we can explain how uh, we can explain the Goldtesman mu theorem that we can uh, efficiently um, simulate the class uh, quantum circuit. So if you prepare the computational basis and if you only have the Clifford gate, we can uh, see that the, all the Wigner distribution of the initial state and the state update function are positive, which means that all this procedure can be done in the classical computer in polynomial time, which means that we can effectively simulate this kind of all this kind of circuit using the classical computers. And we can directly notice that if you have a, a, a non Clifford gate, we call the magic state or the magic gate, this distribution can be negative, and that could be the reason why we cannot simulate this quantum um, circuit in a classical way. So we can now have a, a negative part of the Wigner distribution. However, now people uh, recently have found out that there is a way to uh, uh, circumvent this problem by just forcing that uh, to convert the uh, negative part of Wigner function by just taking the absolute value and make it a positive one. So if it, the uh, beginner function has a negative value, we can simply uh, calculate their absolute value and make it a probability distribution, which is always positive. We can do the same thing for the uh, uh, quantum gate. So we can update this uh, um, using the T distribution, um, the condition distribution by taking the, uh, uh, taking the uh, absolute value of this uh, Wigner distribution of the quantum channel. And in order to get the correct answer, we have to uh, keep tracking the sign of this uh, Wigner distribution because we deleted all this uh, sign information here. So we have to do is uh, go uh, doing the this trajectory method at the same way, but we have to track down all the sign of this uh, associated to this uh, phase phase points. And it has been found out that the uh, tr uh, number of trajectory to see the conversions of this uh, using this uh, sampling method is that uh, this is bounded by the negativity of this um, overall circuit. So each uh, element has an uh, absolute value here, which means that if the uh, Wigner function are all positive, this will be one, and this will be one, this will be one. So which means that there is no uh, negativity and we can exactly sample uh, this trajectory to see the convergence exactly as in the polynomial time. However, if you have a negativity here and this value will be uh, larger than one, so we will need more um, trajectory to be collected. So it means there is a computational overhead in the classical computers. So the good thing is that if you have a total negativity here scales polynomially, then the circuit can be uh, classically similable. And this is quite surprising result because uh, we can now generalize into the more um, um, distribute a uh, more general distribution which can have a negative values. So we can um, uh, divide this uh, negativity into three parts of the like uh, state negativity and the uh, channel negativity, which has a product, which means that we have to calculate the negativity of each channel by each uh, update step. And we have a, also have a final uh, measurement negativity here. So uh, we want to generalize this uh, um, trajectory or the sampling approach in more general sense because we can realize that this is, we use the Wigner function to sample these trajectories 
but we can realize that Wigner function is not the only choice for the quasi property distribution. So our approach is we want to change the distribution, or you can uh, say this as a sampling basis of each uh, optic step. And does it help to uh, have a faster conversions of the um, collecting the samples? And there's already some known result for the continuous phase space. Uh, for example, we can generalize the Wigner function to the um, P function and Q function, or we can even parameterize by using the S parameterized quasi distribution. And this can be applied to be, uh, do some efficient simulation of the boson sampling, which has been re recently reported. And personally, I also have some experience that the P function of the uh, phase space is uh, all can quantify the quantum metrological power, which means that the, if, if you change the distribution of the quasi distribution function, we'll see some different effect and different property of the quantum uh, system. Then our problem is that how to generalize this to the discrete phase space. And it's quite hard because the uh, structure of the uh, discrete and the continuous variable system will be somewhat different, especially Fourier transform is harder to uh, realize in the um, discrete phase space, uh, I mean, it is more complicated. So we have additional terms. When you have want to uh, do the Fourier transform of the uh, discrete phase space, but we can parameterize the quasi property distribution in the following way. So you can see that there is this um, covariance matrix gamma here to uh, parameterize the quasi probability distribution in the general sense. For example, if you have a gamma equals zero, then you have a just, uh, you, you can retrieve the uh, conventional Wigner distribution. So our approach is like is that we can act dynamically change this uh, parameterization from gamma one, gamma gamma zero to gamma one to gamma two, and so on for every step of the update. So we can have a more uh, um, compact uh, sampling of the uh, quantum trajectories. And so I'll show you the result. So we can first consider the single qubit cases. So we can start with some magic state and go through some um, multiple random gates here. I would say that uh, some um, sequence of the uh, gate, which also includes a magic gate. So overall, this uh, quantum circuit will have a negativity. So we can compare with uh, um, sampling this uh, uh, quantum circuit using the conventional Wigner distribution and with the dynamical update of the distribution function. We can see that there is some uh, um, um, benefit of doing this sampling with the parameterized distribution. You can see that the ne overall negativity value has been decreased. And this decreased amount of negativity is a bit small, but interesting thing happened when we add additional nodes here. So you can, add, so in the realistic situation I described about the quantum error correction is that the reasonable uh, assumption is that we can have the error um, between this each of uh, quantum uh, circuits. In th this case, we can actually reduce the uh, 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 degree of the negativity in the significant amount. So, the interesting point is that we measure the final uh, state as a uh, computational basis. So if you sample the Wigner distribution using that, you haven't any negativity. But by adding this uh, additional uh, parameterization, then we can uh, reduce the state negativity significantly. And the trade-off is that we have a more negativity and on the measurement and the channel part. But you can note that the overall negativity of this old, uh, quantum circuit could be lowered by using this kind of uh, um, noise or negativity mitigation technique. Also, we can try this in the 2Q3 case and it'll give some more interesting result. So we start with a two magic state and we can just keep the, uh, our Clifford gate um, quantum circuit to be the Clifford gate, which will not generate any negativity and so as the measurement part. So if we just um, sample this uh, initial distribution using the Wigner distribution, we'll see that uh, there is some negative, negative part on this uh, um, phase space. So the red point here all indicate there's a negative part here in the uh, phase space. However, um, if you see in the measurement, uh, it, which is prepared in the uh, computational basis, 
So we do not have a negativity here. An interesting point is that after optimizing the distribution of this initial um, vegan distribution, we can see that their OD red point has been removed. So we can, um, um, we can have a lowered negativity of the initial state preparation, and we can still not see the um, um, negativity at the final measurement distribution. So which means that uh, overall negativity can be uh, su successfully uh, reduced and which means that we can do uh, this sampling of this quantum circuit efficiently in the classical simulation. And we can change the uh, you know, uh, initial and the final uh, measurement and the preparation part, and we can see some more interesting behavior. So for example, if you prepare a T state and the another uh, kind of magic state in the Q3 uh, uh, state, which is called a strange state, after uh, optimizing over the distribution of the Wigner function, we can see that there is some um, uh, negativity remaining after, even after optimizing the distribution, but we can actually optimize uh, what's the value we can uh, mitigate. So the, although this have some, uh, still has some negativity after the optimization, we can see that the total negativity has been almost halved by um, using this uh, um, dynamical uh, update and optimization over the uh, op uh, parameterized uh, vegan distribution or quasi property distribution. So our next goal is how to scale up these devices, so these approaches. So if you have a multiple uh, input state and more layer of the quantum circuit, and if you have errors in each, uh, um, be between each uh, um, circuit operation, and what would be the uh, result? So our, uh, we are uh, really interesting, inter interested to know that how does the negativity scales up by increasing the number of the input state and the circuit depth. If the negativity scales lower rhythmically, it means that this kind of circuit can be efficiently um, sampled or simulable by the classical computers. And on another thing that uh, we, we saw that uh, is if we introduce the noise in the circuit, we can have a more uh, efficient uh, way to uh, uh, mitigate the negativity, which means the negativity will reduce highly and we can have a more efficient simulation of the quantum circuit. So if you can find some noise threshold to calculate uh, what's the, uh, what would the limit to have an efficient classical simulation of the quantum circuit, that would be a very interesting result. So um, yeah, and then yeah, I want to conclude uh, by um, saying some uh, take-home messages. So first thing I want to say is that is that quantum computing has a huge potential and it's really become becoming real. And I also explained that the quantum error correction is necessary for achieving the universal computation. And I also uh, introduced what is the uh, conventional approach and so what's the new best practice. And also I would like to highlight that we are inter entering the NISC era. And in that, and at this point, it is very important to know and characterize what is the exact quantum advantage and we, how we can um, uh, rigorously or fairly compare with say classical simulation or classical computer. And this is a very important problem. And lastly, I would like to say that um, this is not the only approach on the only in research, research direction that is ongoing in the quantum information science. And actually the quantum computation has been a stem from the quantum information science. And we have a very big stamp like uh, quantum error correction, quantum algorithm and quantum devices. And yeah, I would say that this is very active area. And so many exciting new results and open problems are in the quantum information science. So if you're interested in this topic, you'll find very um, fun and exciting results uh, if you um, can go through this uh, um, topics and area. Uh, yeah, before I conclude, I just want to thank the uh, um, um, co collaborators. Um, basically, uh, most of the work is done with Myungshik. And for the past recovery map and error correction bound, uh, I worked with Alex, uh, Alex Page and the Rick Mukherjee in the Myungshik's group. And for the classical sampling of the uh, quantum circuit, I'm working with in collaboration with Myungshik and the David group in the uh, University of Leeds. 
and there are some um, very good students, and including Nick and Haley, to this um, to work together. Yeah, so and that's all, and thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Hyukjun, and uh, also very thank you so much for advertising next uh, uh, the coming uh, the uh, colloquium by Christopher Jarzinski on November the third, and also. Mm -hmm. Uh, another talk Valerio. by uh, Professor Valerio Scarani on the December the 2nd. And uh, we have some, I think there was a question from uh, uh, Lim Yongnong. Uh, so uh, can you read the, uh, Hyokjun, can you read the uh, question? And uh, could you please answer and uh, explain what, uh, what was that about? Uh, so, yeah, so the question is that uh, the 2015 PRL paper is, I think, the Pashayan's algorithm. Am I correct? Younglong, Young -long, you can uh, 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 type more or yeah, yeah. you can say more. Is, is yes, 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 yes. Okay. So it's about outcome probability, which is not the same, yeah, so yeah, uh, yeah so, uh, so the question is like, uh, yes, uh, yeah, uh, I also see the values. So I, I would like to answer the uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Yonglong's question first. So uh, he asked that uh, there is a several different notion of the classical similability of the quantum circuit. So we can refer to this as a hard simulation and a strong um, uh, weak simulation of the quantum circuit, which means that um, this approach will give a not exact solution of the uh, outcome of the quantum circuit, which means that we have to collect many trajectory. And if you collect enough many trajectory, then you'll see that the difference between the expected result from the quantum computer it would be the same as a, a classical similar result. And that's what we call the weak simulation. And um, here I presented a weak simulation regime here. So yeah, th this can be also uh, counted as a, a notion of the classical similability, the quantum circuit. Yeah. Did it, is it? Young okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. okay. Thanks. okay. Now, uh, also the uh, Professor Valerius Scarani, who is going to speak on December the 2nd, uh, he put a comment on in chatting. And could you read the, uh, Hyokjun, yes. could you read and uh, make a re response? Uh, Valer Valerius uh, commented that there is a paper by Zurel, OK, and Rosendorf uh, claiming that the magic state quantum computing can be simulated with hidden variables. Mm -hmm. uh, be, and it has a non-negative uh, quartile distributions. And it has been um, public, uh, uh, posted in archive uh, this year. Um, yes, I, I think that's a very good point because I, to be honest, I didn't know about this paper. Yeah. So if you can, it'll be great if you can explain a bit more about what's their approach and what's the difference between um, this work. Well, it would be great if I would have understood it, but uh, um, uh, yeah, they, they, they have this proof that, I mean, for, for me, coming from Bell inequality, any quantum computation can be simulated with hidden variables, of course, in a non efficient way, right? Because it's a single machine. Yes. So I can just. Uh, they seem to say that they, they, they have some claims. That, okay, I discussed with them, I didn't fully get it. There was something about having a most of these results about uh, about the negative probabilities having to do a structure something for you mentioned uh, that you want the preparation to be kind of independent of the circuit uh, and if you relax that condition or something of that type then 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 you can do everything with positive probabilities but i cannot yeah. claim i've understood it i just i just heard about it and i would like to have your opinion maybe later by email if you can read it and, and comment Yes, yes. I think that is quite an uh, interesting approach because as far as I know, the hidden variable approach also uses a joint probability distribution. So if you have a, a 
you can if you can assign the uh, hidden variable uh, to assign the joint probability distribution of uh, two different parties, then I think it, it can be something that um, classically similar as you mentioned. So, mm -hmm. but I haven't read this paper, so okay, yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I'm very interested to yeah. take take okay. your time and then send me an email once you have some some opinion. But no, no hurry at all. Yeah, great, great. I will do. I will. Thank you very much. And so, Hyukjun, you should attend the uh, Valerio's talk on December the second. Oh, sure, sure. And, uh, I'm really looking forward. Yeah. Okay. Sure, and, sure. Out there. Uh, do you have any other questions or comments? And uh, in okay, uh, uh, okay Professor so. Yongu Son asked us a question. Uh, Hyukjun, could you read through <laughs> and uh, please make a comment? Okay, uh, I'll just read through his uh, comment. Um, he said that I'm not so familiar with the recent development in this field, so his question can be nice. Uh, given that the errors are inevitable in quantum, in processing quantum logic circuit, what about the storage? Uh, how one can store the data after processing? How one can detect and correct the stored data after quantum data has been stored for a long time? Yes. Um, yeah, I think that that can be also understand as a quantum circuit because um, the basic model that you described here is a storage is doing nothing to the circuit. So you can just encode the data and do not operate in everything. Then that is uh, what we do, the data storage. However, the problem is that um, in the uh, that this problem happens a lot in the quantum um, technology. If you try to interact uh, or doing some operation to the circuit, it could be very noisy. But if you just want to protect and store the quantum information, there's a various way to do. That you can just store it at the cavity QED system and they'll have a long uh, coherence time, or you can uh, safely store it in the uh, photonic qubits. And the, if the photon loss rate is very low, then you can um, effectively uh, um, store the quantum information here. So, and again, that uh, the errors can be occurred here and that can be also done by the same protocols and error correction code. Cool. So you can just uh, consider the circuit as identity channel and you can repeat the uh, error correction code frequently to recover the original information from uh, the errors. But yeah, uh, it, 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 it will also have some limitation in the error, uh, the information loss is, um, is there in the circuit or the sto storage. Okay. Um, oh, Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. And uh, uh, in Korea, uh, the uh, people are going home right now. And uh, so thank you so much for uh, attending this uh, 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 exciting uh, colloquium. <laughs> I think this is a very uh, interesting direction of a quantum error correction. And thank you so much. And also don't forget to come back for the uh, Professor Jarzinski's uh, talk on uh, November the 3rd, and also uh, Professor Valerio Scarani's uh, talk on the December 2nd uh, for this related to quantum information science. And also the, there is a, a Asian Quantum Information Science Conference, AQIS 2020, which was scheduled and rescheduled and rescheduled. And then finally, uh, it is going to be held by uh, online virtual conference on the December 7th to 9th. Uh, uh, so please uh, uh, register for that. And the register fee, registration fee is free, free. So everybody can uh, register for that. And uh, we are going to have an exciting uh, conference in December. And also Jarzinski, November the 3rd, and uh, Skarani on December the 2nd. Don't forget. And thank you so much, everybody. And thank you so much, Hyukjun. And uh, it was a very interesting and, uh, uh, yeah, very, very good. Thank you. And any- yeah, the, uh, uh, the Professor Sohn has an additional question. So oh. yeah, I can answer it, yeah. You're in time, I think. <laughs> Do, do, any other question? Yeah, there is one question from yeah yeah you, you you can you can ask me yeah so sure I uh, as a chat sure oh okay go ahead yeah please go ahead yeah.
Oh, yes. Um, so he asked that uh, the this kind of data storage always require the energy. And I wouldn't say that if you see, just see the quantum information perspective, energy does not play any role here. But in realistic situation, we have to store the uh, quantum information in the physical device and there is always some energy. So there is some, I can, I can show you some result that there is a memory, what you call the memory capacity. So for example, if uh, you can uh, imagine from the uh, example in the two level system, because if the two level system is surrounded by the thermal bath, then they have a different error rate. So the energy then matters the how well we can store the information in the, uh, uh, within the thermal environment. And, and in that case, energy is also the thing that we have to take into account. And then we can define some uh, quantity called the memory capacity, and that can be a function of the both uh, uh, damping rate and the uh, in, in external environment temperature, and what's the energy gap between two uh, uh, different uh, energy level to store the quantum information. So yeah, um, so uh, in, in principle, it is not uh, re related, but in practice, in realistic cases, we have to always consider about the energy storage. And this is also true for the uh, communication and computation theory. So there's Hello. no, quant yeah, I, there's no classical non-virtual memory or hard disk. Yeah, so it depends. So, um, so that's why we are running this um, superconducting qubit or the quantum computing devices in very low temperature. So if the temperature goes up, then yeah, I don't think there's many things that we can store the quantum information at this moment. But we are trying, many people are trying to develop how to uh, store the information in the more uh, higher temperature because to, uh, is basically the same, the fighting against the thermal noise and thermal environment to prevent the quantum information from the decoherence. And yeah, eventually we are trying to find out that is there any way to uh, store the information like uh, as in the hard disk in the classical quantum world. Okay, uh, I lost the connection for a few minutes. <laughs> okay, any, any other uh, questions? or comments? Uh, okay. Uh, oh, yeah. yep. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, thank you so much for all participants and uh, uh, Hyukjun and uh, also for participants. If you are around my office, please come to my office uh, until at, uh, okay, at the 6.30. Uh, I will buy you some dinner tonight, okay? 6.30 to my office at Kiosk. Thank you so much. And uh, the message from the our chairperson of uh, computational sciences, Chang Bong Hyun, thank you very much for your participation. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes. Bye. <laughs> Bye.